Welcome everyone to uh, next episode of Dino Next. Let me get the thing rolling here. So this this covers um, data, computational, parametric modeling, um, really uh, anything that has to do with kind of the future of, of the AEC industry um, as it's perceived uh, here at DLR. So this is uh, season two, episode four. I titled this Talk Data to Me, uh, Data-Driven Design and uh, Convergence. We have a special guest with us today. We have uh, Randy Deutsch from uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he teaches architectural technology and uh, his comprehensive design, virtual design practice. Um, Randy is pretty well known. Um, I probably won't read all of that. Randy, is there anything you want to add to this to this list of of amazing things? <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, no, just I guess I uh, before we get started, just want to say that I've been a practicing architect for over 30 years. Um, and while I teach at the university level for 17 years. Um, uh, building technology. Um, I'm also, as I know, you know, Ryan, uh, immersed in the world of uh, digital technology, and I don't um, treat design, building technology, and digital technology as separate things. Um, I see them as being, um, they all impact each other. Um, I don't uh, just focus on architecture, but the entire building life cycle, and, uh, especially building performance. I know we're going to touch on that, if not uh, dwell on it today. Um, so just make sure uh, you know where I'm coming from. Sure. Sounds good. Um, and then this one, this is kind of the disclaimer for DLR groupers. Um, I want to provide staff with opportunities to learn like this amid project deadlines. Um, but uh, we, we can't put this on, on general time. This is lunch hour for, for most people. That's how I try to time it. So if you're new here, um, not officially sanctioned yet, so do come in a half hour early and leave a half hour late to kind of make up the time. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to start off with, with this quote. Um, it's out of one of Randy's books from, from uh, a previous book, I believe. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's from 2013. It says 90% uh, of the world's data has been produced in the last two years. And that was four years ago. So think about how much data is, is being produced now. I mean, it's it's immense and, and there's there's definitely a value chain that I think we as architects and engineers can can jump into on that. Um, another quote. Um, Actually, I heard can, this go, one. can you go back to the slide? Oh, sure. I want to uh, comment on that for a moment. Um, I mentioned this quote um, in my data blog um, for, for a very specific reason and that is in the AECO industry um, if we know very little about data and big data it's basically that uh, we come across a lot of statistics and quotes like this and as important as they are to understand and know so we understand that data is a force to reckon with at the same time um, as design professionals um, we don't know what to do with a statistic like this uh, it's not something that's particularly usable um, once you're on board what do you do with this information um, so uh, I've made it my charge in all the writing and speaking that I do to move beyond the statistics like this. Um, this is like the catnip at the beginning, but that um, in order to work with data, you got to move beyond this. Absolutely. And then this is a quote from that I heard firsthand, secondhand um, from from my friend Sean on Berg from MBBJ. Um, he said it before uh, he and I were co-speakers at RTC, but um, I heard him say it again, and it's people are getting the wrong impression where Revit's value lies at the database. Uh, we really need to start treating it like one. Um, yeah, so I thought school, that was also. Sure, so in school, um, the entire sophomore uh, class, I'm a university professor at the University of Illinois, as you mentioned, Ryan. Um, I uh, have between 120 and 140 sophomores, so they're primarily 19 years old and they're learning uh, CAD, but they primarily are focused in learning BIM and Revit specifically, in part because Autodesk provides them with the tools for free. Um, at the exact same time that they're learning to use it as a modeling tool, I'm teaching a, um, them the concept or the uh, uh, paradigm that uh, Revit's a database, that it's really just a souped up Excel file. Um, and I teach them to recognize the fact that when they're talking with others, whether it's other professors, whether with their parents and sending their work home, 
that of course they're working with buildings. They're, they're students in the architecture program, um, but that um, as they're modeling, um, I show them how what they're modeling, um, every semester they model a high rise, for example. Uh, each student comes out with a 32 page set of documents for a high rise at the age of 19. And so while they're very adept with Revit per se by the end of the semester, the part that they're not talking about, that they're not really sharing with others, but the paradigm that they definitely understand is that it's a database. The question is from age 19 on, what do they do with that information? Who else talks about buildings as databases? That's interesting. And I did want to talk on, on what, your, what your thoughts or with um, students coming out of college, but we might save that to the end too, because it sounds like kind of um, have a lot to say on that. Um, so these are just some, some, we don't have to answer these, but these are just some, some questions to kind of throw out there, get people on, on the recording to maybe throw in the comments of the video. Um, just thoughts of what about, uh, what, what in the rev model um, in terms of ultimate fabrication or in terms of scheduling or in terms of walls, doors can be automated. Um, what are we doing uh, that can be measured and quantified and maybe we use something like Power BI or Tableau to do that. So just some, just some thoughts out there um, before we get started. So we're going to focus today's thoughts uh, a little bit on data strategy, but mostly on intuition versus data. That's uh, mainly in, in the chapter two portion of uh, Randy's book, uh, Convergence. Um, so, uh, Randy, you can ju jump in here too, but um, I mean, what is the relationship between data and, and intuition? Sure. Um, I think up until recently, we've treated them as two completely different uh, ideas that on the one hand, for those of us um, that are left brain, we, we look at data as being very objective. Um, it's the uh, more finer version of information when you think of the data information knowledge wisdom pyramid. Um, it's very close to the base. Um, it's, uh, it's facts that we gather from out in the world. And intuition uh, really deals with subjectivity and with emotions in a lot of people's minds on the other extreme. And the reality is, is that um, there's a strong relationship between the two. Um, you know, a quick, quick example of that would be where we use data frequently to inform um, our intuition. So up until recently, a lot of designers would have said that they design by waving their arms around. They design by uh, looking at what looks right proportionally, well, let's say when designing a building elevation. Um, and or laying out a floor plan um, and and a lot of clients had to just trust that the architect um, whether they're designing the mechanical systems for building performance for a building whether they're designing the layout of the building uh, trust them at their word um, with input from others on the team but at the same time um, it was very intuition based um, if you go to the other extreme, when you think of generative design tools today, where you plug all the parameters and the constraints into a computer and have it churn out uh, thousands of solutions selecting the two or three most optimized, that might be a data-driven, a very specifically uh, data-centric approach um, that seems to have very little uh, intuition involved. And um, in, when I think of data and intuition, I see the data informing our intuition, and even better yet than that, um, it's improving our intuition. A real quick example of that would be when we use computational tools in real time, uh, modeling tools, let's say, that have the built-in constraints in them. We're working in the computer monitor, um, and the model turns red to inform us that the uh, exponential curving of the facade or the uh, parameters that we're working with go outside the constraints that we've set up beforehand. That red then signals to us uh, a lot like playing the game uh, operation where the buzzer goes off. It teaches you not to go in that direction and you want the model to be green. So as long as the model maintains itself as a green model, you're working within those param parameters or constraints. So where I'm going with this is, is that 
it's the data that's behind the scenes that's informing our intuition as we go. And we don't realize it, but our intuition is actually improving um, because of that experience. So the next time we work with these parameters or similar parameters, work on another project, we intuitively have built in those responses and we become better designers. I don't think there's anything particularly new about that as the actual experience that a design professional goes through. I just think it, it's happening faster and faster now because we're exposed to these uh, souped up tools. Yeah, it's an interesting point. So my kind of spin on that is I put, I, I can build in restrictions to designers that say, okay, hey, maybe you don't want uh, your skyscraper to have zero or one floor. So I take those numbers out of the parameter and I stop it at, let's say, 10 floors for commercial. And then I say you only get five floors total for a residential portion above that. Um, so it's it's not restricting in a bad way. I think I think that's one of the things that, that maybe designers or, or people who don't understand data think thinks it's going to restrict the design. It's going to take out the bad options before you ever even get to them. That's what's nice about the, the computational tools that, that are out there now. And I just want to make sure everybody understands that one. So perfect. Go on to the next slide here. This one is interesting because I think everybody knows we work. I, most people know them from when they when they merged with Case, but um, these guys are terribly interesting to me because I almost see them more competing with architecture firms than competing with real estate firms <laughs> in in a good way. Uh, so, do you think architecture firms should be maybe moving more towards this direction, automated uh, layouts of of um, offices to a, a quantity takeoff of how much you know, interior aluminum glazing systems and uh, create apps that uh, will kind of uh, uh, give a review for a, a conference room or an office or tell you what booths are available. I mean, how how do does any architecture firm really compete with that? Yeah, so I, I would take a step back from the from uh, the examples that you just gave and say um, I do think architects should be thinking and take a lesson from WeWork um, and look at the entire building life cycle. And that's one of the ingenious things that I think WeWork is doing right now is they're looking at the um, the initial stages before uh, there is even a building or even a space to be laid out all the way to getting user feedback in the form of focus groups or in, firm, in the form of um, uh, users chiming in and how well that conference room worked for them so they can improve it later. They're looking at that entire life cycle from beginning to end and that's a missed opportunity I think for design firms and that's the lesson I think that uh, we can all take away from WeWork. The specifics um, in terms of whether using generative design to lay out the offices and so on. Um, I think those um, are all lessons that we can look at and see if they work for our organizations or not, um, if they make sense in terms of the way we work with our clients, the building types that we work with and so on. Um, but I even think that we work must have, um, you know, it's not that they make this look particularly easy per se, but if you're churning out um, if you're looking at data analysis on, let's say, your conference rooms, and you only have, I don't know, 60 or 80 or 100 pieces of input, that's not really big data that you're working with. You're, you're still working with relatively small numbers uh, sure. in terms of the feedback and so on. So I, I, think there's a, I think we're wowed by a lot of things there that are probably still in the works. And I think the lessons that we would take away from a place like where we work um, are important ones, but I wouldn't uh, dwell too much on the specific tools and uh, workflows that they use. Um, sure. Also, we were, you know, before we uh, tuned in today to uh, Dynamo Next, uh, we were having a conversation here, and one of the things that came up was uh, the difference between being the bleeding edge and the uh, cutting edge. Um, so, you know, hopefully I got this right. Bleeding edge would be the very first. Yeah, yeah. leading or leading, uh, leading, leading, not right, leading, uh, uh, leading from your experimentation. There you go, leading edge. Yeah. So our goal would be, in other words, and again, this comes from the theory of the avant-garde. 
where you, your goal is not to be the first one to the market. You really want to be the second one. Um, and by that, the whole second tier, you can be amongst the, the followers. I think you'll be better off in a lot of ways. I have a feeling looking, we're, we're seeing a lot of the ingenious results from tons of research and development that's happening behind the scenes in a case like we were. And I don't think anybody should have to go through all of that again. Um, so I'm hoping that firms can really benefit from the output, the things that have been shared publicly. Um, again, picking and choosing because you want to be leading edge, but you don't necessarily want to go through the pain points of uh, leading. Sure. So my takeaway from this is that they've been able to tap into what I'm going to call the value chain of AEC. They're able to tap into things that we don't consider part of our scope of services that we don't consider important, um, but they really are. I mean, ultimately what the client, how they use it, how much they like their space um, is ultimately going to come back um, to either help or hurt you. And I think um, being able to write an argument for that and, and help write that story um, only provides more value back to the architecture engineer uh, firm. So yeah, they're just able to tap into this value chain the way that we just haven't been able to yet. That's a great point, Ryan. Uh, something I was gonna add too is um, for about 20 years now, uh, behind the scenes I've had a uh, market research firm called Deutsche Insights. Um, I'm a, a co-partner in this company. And I'm mentioning it because um, the data that you collect from users, whether it's in the form of focus groups or more like what I think WeWork's doing where people chime in and say, how did that conference room work for you? Um, a lot of times the responses you get are skewed and they're not 100, you, it's very difficult to actually get people to acknowledge how they really felt about things, especially in real time. Um, uh, you never know what pressures they may feel. They may not know how the data will be used. Um, and, um, and so I think that's an opportunity area, again, uh, looking back uh, 10, 15, 20 years in the architecture profession and doing post-occupancy evaluations, architects have been remiss in not revisiting their projects from a year earlier, let's say, and asking people, you know, how did that building work for you? Or how did that space work for you? Um, so I think, again, uh, the last thing we can take away with WeWork is that they do constantly look for feedback user data, not just uh, passive data, but direct data, which is fantastic. But at the same time as an architect, I think, again, discussing the topic of intuition versus data, I think you have to personalize this information. You have to ask people directly. You have to get them to really talk about their experiences, not just push a button that says, yeah, I give it a three out of five. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good insight. Okay, move on to the next one. Um, similar, similar kind of question, but um, we have a sustainability group as well, um, building performance, those, those kind of things. How do we leverage data in a way that brings about the aha moment for, for future users? Um, and I mean that for internal um, employees, but I also mean that for external, for, for clients, for maybe outside consultants. Um, what's something that's out there that's that's very easy to, to kind of show um, data, I guess. It's kind of a tough question. Sure, I, there's a, yeah, there's a couple different ways that respond to it. Uh, one was, Ben would show me an example from your office in terms of building performance, um, the work that you're doing in perf building performance group here. And uh, just looking at data visualizations of um, uh, how the different spaces and different buildings perform, um, a lot of times just looking at a very clear visualization of before and after um, or opportunity areas for cost savings, that in itself um, I think could be very enlightening and an aha moment. But where I really want to go with this uh, response is, um, is look, you know, we're new in the AC industry, we're relatively new to data. Um, it's something that we've been focusing on. Well, we've been working with data itself for millennia we haven't really been working with big data and lots of data and data in a digital way until fairly recently. And for that reason, I think we have the opportunity to look at other um, sectors, other markets that have had success with it. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. 
we can be inspired by others, and I don't think there's any weakness in doing that. So I think that's, a, that's one um, opportunity area. Another one is in terms of creating aha moments. It's again, similar to that, is the aha doesn't really come from the data. It's having an understand of what are the things that you did as an architect or as a building designer or as a mechanical engineer that wowed others. You know, what were those moments that you had with a client um, or with a building user where they really got what you were doing and is there something in that that you can take away that you could apply to the work that you do in data? So by saying that, I don't mean to weasel around the question and saying this isn't really a data question. Um, I think you can have aha moments, um, and I'll share one with you in a moment, um, one that you may be familiar with, um, that uh, you absolutely can have it using data, but I think um, both looking into other sectors and looking into the work we're already doing that uh, are creating aha moments for people. I think we can apply that. So I think it's a, we'd be remiss in ignoring what we're already doing well, um, you know, just because we're picking up this thing called data and we feel like we have a straitjacket on us. Um, the example I want to mention is, um, you know, it's, I mentioned this in my data book, is an RFP that MK Think was part of out in California a couple years ago, where a school district wanted to renovate their school and add on to it. And uh, they shortlisted 12 firms, and the first 11 firms delivered, um, as part of the shortlist, a presentation of reworking the floor plan, um, of uh, showing a couple different uh, facade or um, you know, building designs uh, for free during the presentation and so on. MK Think went last, and they walked in um, basically with no presentation whatsoever, and they explained having borrowed the data from the community and from specifically from the school, they discovered that um, the school didn't really need to expand, that uh, they just had an incredibly inefficient schedule of when teachers use various spaces, and that all you really need to do is using that data, rework the plan, and um, for at least three to five years, they didn't need a new building. Um, so on the one hand, this is threatening to a design professional. If there is a, anyone in the marketing world in the AAC industry listening in right now, you know, your, your heartbeat is probably going up because you just walked away from a project. But what you really did here, I think, is uh, even more important, which is you've leveraged this opportunity of the world of data to prove yourself as a trusted advisor. And sure enough, MK Think was brought in a couple years later when it did come time for them to expand. Um, as the trusted advisor to work with. Um, so I think that is a real aha moment, both in telling the anecdote, but also going through that experience working with data. I think it's a whole different world we're working in now. And I think to try to uh, plug and chug and work the way we have worked before, adding this one more element called data is not the most effective way. It's almost like you have to uh, make it, break it, and fix it. Um, data provides us with this opportunity to break break the processes, break the habits we've been in in our industry and look at things in an entirely new way. Interesting. Uh, so that took, that took a lot of uh, leadership for MK yeah. Think to, to kind of do yeah. that. I mean, that's really, that's, somebody had to call that and say, this is what we're doing. Exactly. Uh, um, talked about uh, learning from other industries. That's when you mentioned that I'm, I'm up on the Autodesk University blog and I mentioned the term hybrid learning. Uh, so something that I, whenever I go there, uh, I always learn, I always try to kind of go out of my core curriculum. I've I've seen presentations by Bert Rutan. By uh, Bert Rutan is a, a famous uh, aerospace um, uh, designer. He designs uh, spaceships in, in his garage essentially and uh, does amazing work. Uh, Daniel Simon uh, does uh, set design, um, uh, kind of core design for uh, different movies. He's mostly famous for the a couple of Tom Cruise movies that he that he did. He did the uh, Captain America movie. Um, so I was able to kind of look and see how those guys designed and how that could apply to architecture. So yeah, once again, uh, just interesting to, to hear more about the, kind of that hybrid learning, learn from other trades that are out there. So you're saying that's a legitimate thing to do, to look at other market sectors, fields? I, I absolutely think so. If there's always something, it, don't take everything that they do uh, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, but uh, see what what modes and methodologies could apply to architecture, and then you get out of the 
the kind of ridiculous dogmas of architecture that that always you know solve the problems that have already been solved. Um, I, I think there's there's real problems out there that we need to be solving, and I don't think looking at how architects did it 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago is is going to solve the problems of tomorrow. Yep, I agree. Oh, which this is a good lead in. <laughs> so, speaking of which, <laughs> how important is it for the firm's culture to respond to? And again, we're using the word data, but it's really this uh, this digital revolution uh, that you kind of mentioned earlier. How do they respond to that? Yeah. So these guys know. Uh, you know, I was asking them when I first walked in here, maybe an hour ago. Uh, again and again, who is the enlightened person around here who recognizes that this is something important? Because a lot of times I think we have blinders on and we assume maybe through an article, a book, a presentation, a seminar, a conference, that this is what everybody is doing. And that's really not the case. Um, so, so this diagram is from my data-driven design and construction book. And, um, and this was a real revelation. Talk about an aha moment for me. It was a revelation to discover anecdotally as I was interviewing professionals from around the world, whether they're own, building owners or um, engineers, architects, uh, contractors, and so on. Um, it was a revelation to discover that the more that they refer to themselves as being either data centric or data driven, the more they talked about their culture. Um, and, um, and it became very clear that culture was a big part of uh, their accepting data or even just more, like you're saying, more generally, digital technology or thinking of themselves as design technologists and everything that they do. Um, it was the culture of the organization, which frequently um, is top down. It means leadership is recognized this is something important. It wasn't just a memo that went out three and a half years ago and hopefully everybody saw it. Um, but there are things that happen along the way. The behaviors that happen within an organization are rewarded. And by that, I don't mean by gift cards, but intrinsically by the projects, um, by uh, the projects that people have the opportunities to work on, the types of work that is brought into the office, um, by the presentations that uh, in the project teams that allow various individuals to come in and show the data that they've gathered and the reports um, or the dashboards where they've been collecting information and um, the feedback that they've gotten and so on. Um, it's, the, it's really the firm culture that supports this. Yesterday I saw on Twitter there was um, um, even more generally outside of our market and sector, 62% uh, of uh, digital disruption um, that is uh, positively reinforced and work with within an organization is driven by a firm's culture. So it's actually a literal number that's out there. So th that's a mouthful. Another way of putting that is, yeah, if, you're, if your firm is going to positively react to the digital disruption that is not a one-time thing, but it's rolling, you know, it's, it's something that's happening continuously. At the end of every day, you come in the next morning, there's a new plug-in or add-in, and you've got to, you know, be able to respond to it. Um, the new ways of, uh, of merging or combining these tools and so on. It's the firm culture that makes this possible. Again, not just by giving everybody uh, two free hours every week to mess around with technology, but it's seeing it as the water that we drink and the air that we breathe. It's part of every aspect of our work. It's something that's uh, indigenous to what we do, not as this outlier thing. I guess one more thing I'd say about that too before I wanna hear what you have to say, Ryan is um, you can just, from a cultural standpoint, when I was working on my data book, there were two different types of ways that firms, the firms I talked to work with data. One was, it was basically, if you don't mind my putting it this way, the data geek that sat in the corner of the office, they would be called in almost as an internal consultant on project teams. They weren't billable, so it was overhead. They were perceived that way. There was this little bit of a sense that they were gonna cost or take away from the project in some way by bringing them in, and it would be much harder for them then to prove their worth versus having people on the team that work with data, but they also work with everything else that you work on in a project. Data just became, you mentioned a little while ago on one of these slides, um, the new design toolkit. 
yeah, data is just one more tool that you grab for in your design toolkit, whether it's a tool, a work process, whether it's a collaborative process. Data is something that is available to you. Is it something that you recognize and can use at various times and other times you don't use it? Um, and it's really the culture of the data-driven firms were the ones that actually had the data people as being part of the team. They can work on multiple projects at the same time, like a lot of uh, advanced design professionals do, but, but they weren't the, um, the data people sitting in the corner of the office. Sure. Um, and so, man, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> so I kind of jotted some, some things down here. Um, so at my presentation in San Francisco in late August at, at Advancing Computational Design, um, I'll be touching on kind of how to implement it in a firm. Uh, and then it, it, what you said reminded me of three points that lead to a, a single point, which is uh, data and, and computation and, and these types of things. Are, it's not a technology issue. It's, it's a tool that, that we choose or choose not to deal with. That, that's fine. It's just it's not a technology issue. It's not a talent issue. It's, it's not that we're too stupid, we can't learn it, it's too hard. It's, it's not a talent. There's, there, we have plenty of people in-house that, that can do it. Uh, and is it an implementation issue? I don't think it's an implementation issue. I see it as it's a business question. There's kind of the business of design, business of, of data, and I think that's a big component of it. Um, I mentioned earlier kind of tapping into that, that value chain. I, I see this all as um, ways that we can improve our design process. We can get better outcomes. We can get uh, more efficient buildings. We can uh, sell back that data that maybe we didn't use on the project. Uh, so that's that's an interesting point. I think I, I, one of the next slides is kind of who does that data belong to? Uh, maybe we can scoot on over to that. Actually, can you just go, go back just for one second? Because I wanted to just add one more thing, just anecdotally, and that is um, on the left-hand side after data derived, there might even be one more that's not shown there, um, and that's data inspired. So just like with green design, with lead okay. and everything else, we have green washing. There's also a lot of data washing going on out there. So I did want to point out, um, while I don't think Alex and Morrison out of uh, the UK as an architecture firm does this, they do have one building where the ultimate goal of the project, um, according to Jonathan Broughton, um, who works with them, um, with data was the fact that it should the, the building was meant to appear as though the facade of the building was a randomized data set um, but it wasn't actually driven by data at all they didn't actually <laughs> use data in any way um, and I'm seeing more and more of that as well um, so that's just it is a cautionary tale perhaps just like this greenwashing there's also data inspired design yeah so yeah it's also very important to kind of capture that process I think along the way, and we're, when we're trying to do better, I'm actually partially in charge of doing that for DLR, so that just reminded me. Um, <laughs> good, to, good to give a good reminder every once in a while. Sure. Um, where do we store all this? Oh, maybe went to. Okay, never mind. We'll go to this one. Uh, where do we store all this? Um, I should have. The next question after this maybe should have been who owns the data, because I know we'll get to that. Uh, maybe we'll just do both those questions. Where do we store it all? Who has this? Who owns it? Who's making it? Um, how do we show it? I, it? It depends on the company size. Um, I belong to uh, a, a group, uh, K Connect. Um, it's a knowledge management uh, group uh, with Chris Parsons out of San Francisco, um, and uh, has spoken uh, two or three times at their conferences. Um, so it's, a, it's some of the best AEC knowledge management folks from around the world that come in. Um, and I guess where I'm going with this is um, a lot of firms have intranets where they internally, you guys have an intranet? Yeah, so you internally share information. You know, we frequently will hear this line that, you know, at the end of every day, our greatest resource leaves with all, our, you know, all that wonderful information. And when they leave the organization, permanently and move on, let's say to another, either, either retire or move on to another company, they're leaving with all that knowledge. And that's something that we want to capture. Um, a lot of times the knowledge management person at the organization will frequently capture 
information and knowledge. Again, on that data knowledge, inf data information knowledge wisdom pyramid. Um, uh, but they don't think about capturing the data. And I think a lot of the data can be stored in a more generalized way so the whole firm is aware that it exists. Even if for their particular project, they would need to uh, maybe find more specific or more recent instances of it. They could see what other uh, teams within the, the multi-office uh, firm, such as yours, is doing and in how they leverage that data and then apply it on their own project. So I don't think that's the only answer, but I think that's way, a way within an organization that it could be uh, stored without getting into, you know, how do you literally store it given the size of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely meant more store and share. Um, we yeah. do have um, our Square One. Uh, it's kind of, again, with KA Connect, it's uh, kind of like an internal Facebook page where we can uh, sh uh, share uh, what's going on in the company. We have been able to tap into that um, and create links uh, to uh, data, databases, data warehouses, data streams being one of those um, that we're able to do that. Um, and then there's also some other things I've been able to work on. Uh, my amazing wife is also a, a graphic designer, web designer, front end coder. Um, so she's been able to uh, build some of my ideas and, and make them reality. Um, so one of those examples would be like, um, taking our Dynamo files and putting them online um, through an external uh, website database that we can search, filter, add me metadata to. There's nothing saying that we couldn't do that for EPW files or you know, advanced weather files um, and different ASHRAE data and things like that so that it's a little bit closer to our fingertips um, and a much more um, accessible, searchable than it would be on just the standard server. I think searchability if that is a word, um, yeah. is critical. Yeah, yeah, so when I mentioned knowledge management folks, um, you know, I like to think of them as knowledge, information, and data librarians. And so they want to make all of this easily accessible to you. And so they're going to, you know, using the ontology that's available to them, they're going to make sure that you can find what you're looking for immediately. If not like a good librarian, they'll help you find it. Um, but I agree, that's, um, uh, you don't want to waste time um, digging right. stuff up if somebody else, especially if somebody else has had their hands on it at least once. And uh, I should have reminded people, anybody's welcome to chime in too and uh, share some thoughts. I mean, absolutely. I, I know everybody's thinking and, and got the juices flowing. Um, so feel free, anybody to, to jump in at any time. Um, I, I do like this question because um, it kind of goes back to a little bit uh, on intuition and data. Um, is it important for all designers to have just a total full grasp of, of data, or is it just a phenomenon for guys like me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I guess my take is, and I think you could probably pick up on it from the disparaging comments I made about the data people who sit in the corners of the offices versus being <laughs> integrated onto teams, that while I don't think everybody needs to be a data geek at all, any more than everybody, I don't think everybody needs to be a coder and work with scripting. I think it's incredibly important to understand data and scripting, um, to know that it's, you know, that it's out there, where it exists, where it's open source, how you can create it using sensors and other means, um, how it's been success, you know, through case studies, successfully used um, on projects, whether it's within your own organization and, or others. Um, it's just another tool in our toolbox. And I think we're at a complete loss as a profession if we just rely on, you know, the sole geniuses like yourself to really be the ones who understand it and appreciate it. And then the rest of us just keep doing what we've always been doing. <clears throat> so I don't think, um, I don't think there's time in our day for each of us to get up to that same level where we're able to leverage the data. I do think it's incredible incredibly important to be able to recognize when, going back to an earlier slide that you had, uh, know when to automate, know when to access data and apply it on a project. Um, even if it's something that we take home at night and do and bring in the next morning to provide one more layer of feedback uh, beyond the subjective uh, implications for certain things. Um, so 
Um, that's, that's my stance, and it might be it's a little idealistic, but uh, um, I'd be interested to hear what yours is. Yeah, so um, I, it, it, yeah, it's really hard to um, push this on everybody, I guess, and I'm, and I'm not trying to. Um, the, way I, the way I'm approaching it now is there's people that want to know about it but don't want to learn about it. There's people that want to see it but don't want to get their hands dirty, and then there's people that see it that do want to get their hands dirty and, and want to get into this. And, and that's what I'm trying to kind of filter out and find in the firm. Um, who can who – can, who has a passion for this and sees the, sees the value in it that can help me, help us, help the firm kind of dive into this and start to create information that ultimately helps us. Because I've been able to use this um, and save dramatic amounts of time. Like we're talking about collapsing processes that took, you know, three, four days down to like 60 seconds. Exactly. We're talking about collapsing a process 9,000%. And it's so unbelievable. That's the other thing I'm having trouble with. It just seems so like it's magic or something. Like, okay, right. what so did that, you forget? Right. You know, so what, when you, what's missing? Right. So when you mention something like that, I'm thinking of a computational tool like Dynamo. The first time you show it to someone, that's an aha moment as far as I'm concerned. And you, you capture that and try to figure out what is the equivalent to doing that with data. You're making it sound like you actually have had that experience with data. Every day. <laughs> every, every single day, exactly. And yeah. I don't think everyone knows that. I mean, I'm not going to yeah. speak for everyone in your firm, but, um, but that's, uh, it, you know, uh, how do you disseminate or share those moments? Yeah. Uh, really, it's, it's been tough. It's, it's been uh, having, you know, a, a show in, inside a DLR like this that uh, can, can express those thoughts and catalog it in such a way people can come back to and, and see those moments. Um, and really, it's me sharing something. Somebody throwing a challenge out at me and saying, oh, but you can't do this, or, or wouldn't it be nice if we did that? And then so I kind of build it, and then I'm like, okay, is this what you mean? And then we make it better, and then we make it better after that. Um, so it's, it's, it's about reliving those aha moments and, and sharing them. Um, so right. kind of getting back to your idea of the, the knowledge management and the share management of it. And so we're just trying to make that better uh, and faster and, and and everything, you know, uh, all the time. And that's why I'm building like a website that can store some of these um, internally to us that gives a description of it, the metadata behind it, how it operates, the tools and plugins that you need for it to, to work, and then how it works. I think that's that could be really anything. That could be a, a Revit model to a Dynamo script, to a Grasshopper script, to um, using uh, ASHRAE uh, standards and codes that integrate right into you know, our, our live active models throughout the whole process, not just like once every two weeks to do a check, but like constantly. So I think that's, um, yeah, that's the end of that thought. But. I had a really enlightening experience a couple uh, years ago, and that was um, when I was interviewing uh, uh, Jonathan Schumacher at Thornton Thomas Center in New York, um, you know, just sitting over coffee for a couple hours discussing data with him. And he had mentioned one of the tools, uh, the apps that he came up with that uh, does that structural test that removes every column in the building, looks for the weak link. And he, you know, he's able in a two to three hour period using that app on any high rise project of any height or complexity um, and, uh, you know, and find the weak link. Um, and, um, and that was great to hear. So a couple weeks later, back at my university down in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, I'm sitting there uh, listening to the brilliant managing partner of Thornton Tomasetti and Brazil uh, discuss uh, how they work and the process that they use. And she, amazingly enough, mentions the, the process, the tool, the uh, technique they use, uh, as all structural engineers use, of removing the column um, and going through that analysis and how in just three days, she's telling the 200 people in that auditorium, in just three days, we can get the results. Um, and think about how, you know, how fast that is. And I just, you know, I was dying, you know, to raise my hand and say, you know, Yanatin works in your office in the corner with the other data people. And, you know, you could do it in a matter of hours. But, but I think that the key message there is, again, from a knowledge management, intranet, communication standpoint, the bigger message there is a lot of times we have the capabilities within our organizations. Um, we have the expertise 
and we're not all aware of it. We're not, we're, I mean, we're busy people. We all have meetings. It's hard to know what everybody else is working on. Uh, maybe you've got a uh, company blog and you can put, you know, you can upload and tell a little story about your latest tool. There's no guarantee that everybody's going to be aware of that. Um, but I think that's a little bit of a cautionary tale um, that I could see from my own perspective doing research that uh, is sort of a little bit of a weak link within organizations. One thing I was going to say real quickly, the two things working, um, one thing working against data here with this question, um, um, whether people should have full grasp or not, is the fact that data is a prosaic, uh, some people would say boring, uh, need to know only type of topic. <laughs> it's nowhere near as interesting as computational tools, and even computational tools, most people who don't use it, their eyes glaze over when they hear about it. Um, and so data is a tough sell. And so there's ways I think we can do a better job uh, professionally of working with them, talking about it, um, you know, without necessarily even invoking data. And that brings up another thing. I think every office needs to have, even before you get to this question, two people. One is an expert and the other one is an evangelist. You actually need to have someone in the company really gets this stuff and who could literally do it and help get, you know, get others on board to do it. But, but the evangelist is the one who doesn't necessarily ne really need to have to do it. It's just the one who uh, can just really get others inspired, just meeting with them and uh, talking with them and sharing what they do. They need a champion. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Right, we'll go on to the next one here. Um, I do, I'm a big fan of this. <laughs> this is probably my favorite graphic you've ever come up with. <laughs> uh, so what does all this stuff come under? I, I, you mentioned earlier um, there's there's no one person that really fits this mold. I know where I'm weak at in, in this chain of, of hacker, data scientist, algorithm builder, architect. Uh, even Nate Miller agrees with you. There's, there's no one size fits all um, person at, at any firm that really has like every single core background that you'd need to, to be the architect, hacker, scientist, builder. Um, but the, so what, what does this all fall under? Does it fall under digital practice? Does it fall under like a big data asset manager leader at the firm? Does it, is it BIM? Is it, I don't know. Yeah, let's, let me take a step back for a second. If you write a book and they used to have these things called bookstores, you know, you physically would go into <laughs> or Amazon, and, right? And the key thing is, is when you wrote the book as an author, you working with the marketing team or the publisher had to decide what shelf it went on in both the library and also in the uh, in the bookstore. And if you couldn't just pick one, you know, like if you had a hybrid book that would fit under vampires and under Abraham Lincoln, you know, you still had to pick, you know, it had to be literature. You had to pick one topic. Well, <clears throat> similarly, I think um, there is this mindset that we need to, uh, you know, to get funding for this evangelist, for the expert within the office, to get people to be trained working with data. You need to categorize it so they know what budget it goes under, so they know what to tap into. Each firm is going to have a different answer. So I guess where I'm going with this is my take is it doesn't really matter which one as long as you have one that works, whatever that category is. My personal take is just put it under knowledge management and call it a day. But if your BIM budget is three times the amount and at the end of every year you have BIM money left over, then yeah, make it BIM, you know? Sure. Yeah, I'm sure that makes our BIM managers on the, on the call really happy. <laughs> <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> okay, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, yeah, I don't mean yeah, to be I'm facetious sure. in saying that. I don't, yeah, oh, maybe no. you have... <laughs> It's all good. Okay. <laughs> no, it's no. We understand the point. That's a really good analogy of of what shelf does it go on. Um, that's definitely something I'm grappling with. I I would think it's. I see a lot of digital practice leaders out there at the some of the larger firms that that already kind of get it. So we're just trying to to figure out what it is. And um, I I don't really have an answer for this because um, I'm kind of in it right now. I'm still sure. trying to trying to figure it out, but. Uh, yeah, it's like a fish thing. What category does water go under? Or birds, what category does air go under? Right, you're you're swimming in it, you're breathing it, and uh, it would be very hard to say from your perspective. But I also just think uh, from just a very logistical, strategic standpoint, put it under knowledge management, 
just so it has a place to stay. But not every company is as large as DLR and uh, needs, you know, doesn't have knowledge management, let's say. Um, so the next take would be is who's got the largest budget? <laughs> I'm just plug it under there. <laughs> I like said, it. Said as a good academic, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, Tony, did you take a Twitter picture yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> thought about, I thought about that like three slides. Oh, I know Randy's going to. There it is. Oh, I thought you were reaching for your phone. <laughs> uh, okay, we we kind of went over this. I skipped ahead like three. Um, is every every database we make the AE firm's property? Does it belong to the client? Is it? I mean, I, we kind of choose whether or not we want to open source it. I guess um, in, in some sense, but I know a lot of people want to keep it private. So another kind of question, um, where it's the same question of um, who does the the uh, revenue model belong to? Is it a contractor? Is it the owner? Is it the architect? Who owns kind of who owns the rights to it? Yeah. So one way, you know, teaching professional practice for 17 years, there's a response that's a legal response, and this is how the courts see it. Blah blah blah. Let's not get into that here. I don't even think that's necessarily what you're you're asking. But there is a uh, legal answer to the question. But I think even more important than that, there's the one that if you're working, especially on an integrated team, and by that I don't even necessarily mean an IPD or an integrated project delivery project, but a team that meets together from day one, at the very least with the owner involved, uh, the architects or the design professionals uh, and the contractors sitting around the table from day one, if that's the case, they can come to an agreement in terms of the answer to this question. Um, but I think much more on a philosophical uh, level is that question of um, what's the purpose of your firm? Um, I know, again, teaching professional practice, that every licensed architect um, has a basic ethic charges that they have to follow, and one is, is giving back to uh, the emerging professionals within their organization. One is giving back to the profession and is having open source information and data one way that you're giving back. Um, that's a way to interpret that. Um, but I, I'm calling it philosophical because I think the uh, leaders within the organization have to decide um, who, it's not legally who owns this so much as what is our attitude towards this? Will it help the, move the ball forward? Will it, help advance all firms, therefore raise, you know, uh, raising all firms at the same time? Will it help improve um, not just the economy, but help improve the environment uh, if we were to share this information and so on? It made it public and gave it away for free and so on. Um, so I think that's one, one way that I think firms have an opportunity to look at this and capture, lever leveraging the data, capture um, an opportunity that has not been exploited. It's a powerful way for them to differentiate themselves uh, from other organizations. I would say a firm like uh, Karen Timberlake is a firm that's, uh, you know, promoted this, um, sharing their tools and data and so on um, as um, uh, one, of, one of the leaders in this area. But I think there's definitely room for others. Cool. Um, and, and I know we're we're doing that. I know Prem's doing that with his EUI website. Um, we've really started a cataloging, and, and Prem, you can jump in any time if you're still on um, cataloging um, EUIs from from our projects around the firm, and, and really sharing those, um, uh, really showing that we're the the global leaders and global experts on um, on that. So absolutely, Ryan. I just wanted to echo that same um, that thought. Um, and Randy, just a quick plug. I've been a big fan of your um, blog as well as book uh, for a long time now. So thank you for thank taking you. the time. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask, I've been burning to ask this question. So I don't know if, if we're waiting till the end or Ryan, what do you want to, what do you want to do? That, that is kind of the end. Yeah. Cause these are just, uh, <laughs> yeah. that is it. <laughs> Good timing. Well, yeah. maybe, maybe you're probably getting to it in the, in the next couple of slides, but um, here's, here's a question I have. Um, I see, um, 
data is just another um, entity in our toolbox, like you had said. Um, however, it goes through the same cycle as pretty much everything else within the firm does. Uh, it starts with we need to have uh, a skill set within the firm um, that is uh, capable of doing research, and that's data centric research, and then capable of doing modeling. Uh, using data as the, as the primary um, focal point. And then also the third step is analyzing data. And then the fourth step is visualizing this data. So I see this as a four part series of research, modeling, analysis, and visualization. Do you see, how, I mean, is this how you see a data would be embedded in the fabric of a firm in, in a fashion like this? I do, I do see it that way, Prem. That's, I think, a great question. Um, and it may be, uh, without plugging uh, my current book that just came out this month, Convergence, I am seeing those four things converging. So in other words, I wouldn't necessarily, it, a lot of this comes down to the way, again, from the evangelist standpoint, the way we talk about it, if it sounds like a long slog that we're gonna go through, just like we got trained in Revit or BIM years ago, and you know it's going to take six months before we're up and running. We go through a pilot project, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's it just becomes like you say the way you describe it, one more thing. Mm -hmm. And so something I talk about a great deal is how data is not one more thing. It's something that's already there. And I think you know mentioning one of your four uh, facets, which is visualization, is a perfect example. And that is for millennia. We would create projects, and then the day before a presentation, we would create these visualizations manually by looking at what we came up with, whether it was creating a spreadsheet and plug in the square footage, how many two bedrooms versus three bedrooms, and so on and so forth. And we'd sometimes do a bar, you know, a bar chart or a pie chart to try to describe it to someone. And just the fact that those visual, visualizations are now indigenous to what we're doing it's something that I guess the current generation just takes for granted that the visualizations are right there along with the data, but that mm. is relatively new to anyone that's over 35 years of age. And I think that's similar to the analytics and the gathering uh, mm -hmm. with the sensors. I think a lot more of this is becoming converged and uh, happening linearly. Do you need to learn about it separately? Absolutely, because you need to know the difference about each of those four areas, if not more, mm -hmm. um, as in the, what each one does and how it works for you. But I think uh, what makes it particularly exciting and closer to that aha moment is when you do discover that there is much more overlap, that if, when you think about it as a Venn diagram, it's becoming closer to a, you know, a single circle these days. It's not quite there. Um, but, but, you know, I think of this as the age of Ben right now in that we're getting very close to the simultaneity that we're just going to take for granted in a few years of those four different areas. Yeah. Um, and I think to the extent that we treat it that way, or at least talk about it, even though we're not quite there, by the, you know, by the way, a real quick example of this is for the longest time, anybody who knew about real time uh, real time using the cloud or even right before the cloud would we'll talk about real time with quote, you know, air quotes and would we'll talk about real time in terms of near real time feedback and so on. Now we don't even talk about it that way. Everything's real time because we have the cloud. You can mm -hmm. access this anywhere, mobily, out in the field and so on and so forth. I think similarly, we're getting really close to the instant, yeah, instant or uh, simultaneous instantaneity of things happening with this overlap that mm. as an evangelist and a leader within an organization, we can see that and visualize and know it's just a matter of a short period of time before we arrive there. And that's the way we really need to talk about it. Got you. That's, that's helpful. Thank great you, Randy. Question. Yep. Great question. Thank you. For mm -hmm. Yeah. So I brought up um, kind of a visualization chart. It, it may, spurred kind of an idea uh, as you were talking about uh, something to the effect of maybe building costs, the design, errors, sensor data, all coming into kind of a singular uh, converged platform that says, okay, this is up on the cloud. I can, I can publish this live. It keeps 
feeding that, that data information in. So as the design changes, which changes daily, if not hourly, um, that feeds up to the cloud and this dashboard that says, hey, your building costs this much, it's, you know, EUI is this value. Um, you've got an error on floor three in room two, you know, 201, whatever the room might be. All of that information is, is fed real time to you instead of spaced out over three months Mm -hmm. where it's being built and then oopsie it's too late we didn't meet the program of the of the client because we didn't have an error check for if we were meeting the programmatic needs mm -hmm. so i i think randy's on to something so. <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting too that uh for for at least the last 120 years practice has been ahead of um academia we always say that that you know if you want to know what's on the horizon that's why i do practice-based research uh which is just a fancy way of saying uh, talking to design professionals like yourself about what's currently on the table we're not allowed as academics to speculate about the future or at least we're not rewarded for it nor um are you necessarily all working on r d projects you know about the next great big thing but by being able just to look at what's on, in your monitors right now what's top of mind for you today, uh, academics are able to connect the dots and be able to anticipate what's on the horizon, um, mm -hmm. which uh, ought to have some value. So I guess where I'm going with this is, I still think that those in practice, um, such as yourselves, are on the forefront, are anticipating what's on the horizon, but at the same time, you gotta earn a living, you gotta keep the lights on, you gotta grow the office and hire people and find new clients, it's a business. Um, so I think I see a little bit of the roles changing a little bit, that in uh, research and development, particularly in academia, we're kind of taking the charge right now, not leading things so much as interpreting what you guys are doing. Okay. Well, I, I think that about wraps it up. Um, I just took a screenshot of, of all the names on the uh, on the sheet. So uh, I was hoping to have a video uh, camera today, but I'm holding up Randy's latest book. I'm going to give it away to the people that attended today and stayed through the whole thing. Um, so we're going to, I'll do a drawing here and um, I'll email the winner out. Uh, once again, I want to thank Randy for, for coming in and, and giving us his time and his thoughts um, and allowing, allowing us to share with him um, uh, our thoughts. Uh, and uh, thank you to Tony Brown, Eric Rays, to Ben in the uh, Chicago office for, for letting Randy in. I appreciate it. Thank you. This is great. Keep it, keep it up. Keep up the interest and keep up the Dynamo Next yeah. episodes. These are wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Don't forget a Twitter picture. <laughs> uh, Got it. Th uh, thank you, Ryan, for putting this together, Ryan, and thank you, Randy.